Cricket was on the verge of popularity in the United States. Matches were held in Philadelphia, Albany, and even Cincinnati. In 1844, two new challengers arose in New York, the Union Star of Brooklyn and the New York Cricket Club. The St. George Club was an exclusive one, restricted to men born in Great Britain, but the new organizations were open to all cricketers. The New York Cricket Club was faced with the common problem of city ball players, the lack of good places to play. Their solution was to cross the river to New Jersey. Edwin Stevens was happy to accommodate them at Elysian Fields. He kept the rent low, cleared the ground at his own expense, and offered his gardeners to maintain the playing grounds. A similar offer was accepted by the baseballists. The change of location coincided with the change of name from the Gotham to the New York Baseball Club. William Wheaton and his fellow ball players were enchanted by their new home. Those fields were truly Elysian in those days. There was a broad, firm greensward fringed with fine, shady trees where we could recline during intervals when waiting for a strike. Often our families would come over and look on with much enjoyment. On April 25, 1845, the railroad depot near Madison Square burned to the ground. The vacant lot was taken over for the new building, so the ball players found a new place to play on the slope of Murray Hill, once the site of Sunfish Pond. The New York Baseball Club was thriving, but some of its younger members were unhappy. As William Wheaton put it, the membership soon swelled beyond the fastidious notions of some of us. There was also the issue of expanding the game by sharing it with outsiders. Well do I remember, Duncan Curry said in 1877, the afternoon when Alex Cartwright came to the field with his plans drawn on a piece of paper. The sun shone beautifully. His plan met with a good deal of derision, but we finally consented to humor him. When we saw what a great game Cartwright had given us, we set out to organize a club to play it, according to his suggestion. Wheaton left the New York club, along with William H. Tucker, son of an original Gotham, to help Curry and Cartwright. As veterans of the game, they were appointed to draft rules and bylaws for the new baseball club. Considerable thought went into defining the rights and duties of members. Fines would be levied for absence, tardiness, or swearing during games. There were two significant changes from the rules Wheaton had written up for the Gothams. The old club had insisted on fly catches, but the Knickerbockers would allow outs on one bounce. The big innovation was borrowed from cricket. Before each game, the president would designate an umpire responsible for keeping the game in a book and noting all violations of club rules. Traditionally, all disputes were settled between the captains of the two sides, a coin to be tossed if necessary. Now, according to the 17th rule of the Knickerbocker Club, all disputes and differences are to be decided by the umpire, from which there is no appeal. The Knickerbocker Ball Club was officially organized on September 23, 1845. Like the Gothams, the club took their title from the works of Washington Irving. Curry was chosen as president, with Wheaton as vice president, and Tucker serving as secretary and treasurer. Knowing they would soon be evicted from Murray Hill, the Knickerbockers decided to try New Jersey. On the afternoon of October 6th, enough members to make a game assembled at the Barclay Street Ferry, crossed over and marched up the road to the Elysian Fields. Wheaton, the most familiar with the rules, was chosen as the first umpire, and he posted the lineups in the new game book. Curry and Cartwright were the captains. There were limits that first day. Only seven men played on each side, and the game was called due to darkness after three innings, Curry's team up by 11 aces to eight. The Knickerbockers met twice a week until mid-November. Other ball players soon made the trip to Elysian Fields. Once there, Doc Adams recalled, we were free from all restraint and throwing off our coats, we played until it was too dark to see. I was a left-handed batter and sometimes used to get the ball in the river.